curtain go away. <laughs> good morning, my friends. Uh, it, well, good afternoon, my friends. It is Sunday afternoon, and it is time for Musically Minded. Of course, I've got my co-host, DJ D42, Diana, um, who is also in your chat room there, taking good care of you and letting you know all the good things that are going on. And uh, I see we have a DJ Frantic in the chat room and i believe dusty chin is in the chat room as well and um of course if you all have any questions uh for us today go ahead uh you know uh type them out get them into the chat there and uh hello dusty chin and we will uh of course address those as we get into the show um, let's see, what is going on, Diana? Diana, what's going on? Uh, tell, tell me about Wednesday. Uh, this, uh, this Wednesday, Wednesday we, have we have new music o'clock hosted by Tenderlash. Yes, Tenderlash. And of course, on Saturday night, uh, we will have the Wicked Party doing the swinging beats. And, uh, and then next Sunday, we'll be back again doing musically minded of course uh my biopsy is tomorrow morning so um uh so hopefully it won't interrupt any of the show uh any of the shows we've got going on while i'm recovering it shouldn't interrupt any of that but that's what's going on um let's see uh so why don't we just go ahead and launch into the show. Diana, um, would you kindly uh, update us on where we left off last week? Um, 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 last week, let's see here. Uh, I'm going to say, what are the things that you have done through the talent agencies as we were talking about uh, different places that we see DJs? Oh, right, right, right. Um, Okay, well, I do see that there's some. Uh, I do see that there are some questions going up here too in the chat here. So, um, so let's <laughs> Dusty Chin. My first question is: David Solomon, Goldman Sachs CEO, actually a good DJ? Hmm. Suspicious side eye look. Um, I would say he's probably as good a DJ as Paris Hilton. Um, uh, and yes, okay, so I do, we do see the question there from DJ Frantic, and we will, uh, uh, that is con sort of continuing from the questions that we've had from DJ Frantic before. What do you think, Diana? Should we uh, launch into that and then swing back around? Uh, we, could uh, we could do that. All right, would you, would you kindly uh, read us all out for it, read it all out for us here because it's going by too fast for me to catch it. Okay. Okay. Um, here's the question. The promoter or bookie tells you at this moment, right now, they are not taking any new DJs for their events, but they tell you they can still email. You can still email them your press kit and demo. They also tell you the best of luck. Okay. Should I email them my information or should I wait down the road to ask them when they are looking, um, if they're taking on any new DJs and then send my info? Oh yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, I, uh, okay. Yeah. This, this kind of continues along with the communications thing, which of course Diana is extremely good at. Um, at, well, how do you, how do you feel about that, Diana, as somebody who has received a, a fair number of press kits and demos in their day from a, from a, uh, a more from a band booking perspective, I, I, I presume, mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. um, but yeah. So, uh, what do you, what do you think about that? Uh, what, what, uh, I, I think my question is what would be the reasoning now? Uh, and I have, I have some thoughts in mind. What would be the reason that a promoter or booker uh, would be like, well, I'm not looking for anything right now, but send me your stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so what do you think? Well, um, usually I like to, we, we have liked to book things at least like three months in advance. So, you know, after that, when, when it's, you know, slowing down, like, 
you've already had all these other things already booked, it's more the polite way to say, like, you know, we, we, we will still be looking for things, just not right at this moment. And there, there are better ways of saying that. And um, you always want more um, talent in your, uh, for lack of a better word, arsenal. <laughs> more talent. Roster, um, perhaps. Say it again. Roster. Roster. Thank you. That's a better word. Roster. Um, uh, that you can, uh, the more versatile your roster, uh, the better. You know, that is quite exactly what I was thinking. Um, I would, when, uh, when I was doing, uh, book, a, any kind of book, anytime I've been doing any kind of bookings, it has been that way, whether it's, you know, booking bands where it's kind of like, well, I don't have any shows right now, but six months from now I will have something going, you know what I mean? And, um, you know, uh, especially when you're doing indie stuff, it has a lot to do with budget, right? It's like, I mm -hmm. can't afford yes. to do something right now. <clears throat> um, but yeah, absolutely. Um, having, having the talent in the roster so that you know that you can draw on it, um, mm -hmm. in your, you know, when you're putting stuff together in the future, um, I, I am definitely of that mindset. Like I want the right talent for the right event. Yes. yes. Um, and of course this actually does kind of lead back around to what you were talking about too, because the more versatile you are as a DJ, um, the more you will be picked up for, um, how do I say you, the, 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 the more, the more different types of things that you can fit your DJing style or whatever it is into, like the, the more, the, the, the more diverse, um, uh, uh, your repertoire, so to speak, um, mm -hmm. the more likely you will get picked up to do things because you will be the right person for more things. You will be the right DJ for more things. If that makes sense. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I, I totally agree that, uh, the reason, the reason that a, a, a promoter wants you to do that is so that they can essentially vet you um, uh, mm -hmm. and make sure that uh, when they are booking you in the future, that they're booking you for the right gigs and that they're, they're getting you the right kind of gigs for you, for one thing, which is something that uh, a, good age, a good agent will do that um, and uh, hopefully challenge you as well. Um, but to find to to find gigs that fit the personality of the talent that they manage, and uh, that that's another thing that kind of loops back around to what Diana was kicking off with uh, today. There, so um, we're almost there, Diana. There's a few more stepping stones on this detour. Um, and I, I really do think it's a good question, Frantic. And my advice would be give them what they're asking for. Um, if you wait, they will forget. <laughs> um, you know, uh, promoters and bookers, um, they, I mean, get approached a lot. You know, it's a lot of it's a lot of cold calls. It's a lot of people soliciting them, and um, and as as we have all, as we have always advised, um, it's uh, keep it simple. Help the promoter do their job. Uh, don't overwhelm them with hyperbole and and that sort of thing. But yeah, definitely give them what they're asking for because um, that is how you're going to lead to the future booking. Like they, you know, again, we were talking about how the electronic press kit, your EPK, isn't the thing that gets you, I'm fiddling, isn't the thing that gets you the gigs. It supports the gigs that you get. Um, it is a tool that the promoters use 
um, to present you to to the audience. Um, and um, um, so, yeah, you're going to want to make sure that you give them your EPK, your relevant links. You know, um, uh, one of the things that we didn't really get into too much uh, I mean, we've touched on it a little bit, but uh, when we were talking about different places that we see and hear DJs now, you know, we had talked about, <clears throat> this is where I'm going to swing it around finally, Diana. We had talked about, mm-hmm. you know, like, you know, broadcast, different kinds of broadcasting, and we had talked about, um, obviously, diff- you know, some different kinds of events, which we'll get to some more of that. Um, and, um, you know, we talked a little bit about VR and stuff and, and Twitch. We didn't really talk much about like podcasting and stuff like Mixcloud, right? Um, which are popular, you know, there's a handful of popular platforms. I'm just going to say Mixcloud for everything. Like some people use SoundCloud, um, which I'm, I'm pretty sure you can use SoundCloud for DJ mixes now. Like you used to be able to, and then you couldn't, and now you can again. I just use mine for the remixes and the music. Um, but I do use my MixCloud um, to uh, upload the audio versions of, of some of the stuff that we've done. Some of my old mixtapes are on there too for nostalgia's sake and, uh, you know, so I can listen back and be horrified by how bad a DJ I was when I thought I was good. (laughs) Which hopefully we always do. It never goes away, my friends. Something to remind you. It never goes away that, um, uh, you know, uh, well, you know, we can talk a little bit about keeping it interesting too. And, but yeah, that it never goes away. You always have that little bit of, I, I like to, I like to say I get anxious for my gigs, not nervous. You know, uh, you always have that bit of the stage fright kind of thing and all that kind of thing. Um, uh, but yeah, so, uh, DJ frantic to wind up with your question, give them what they want. Uh, don't bug them too much, but do your proper follow-ups like we had talked about previously, you know, give them some time. Um, but also just sort of pop in every once in a while to say, Hey, just wanted to let you know, I'm still interested. Hope you got all the stuff you need. Let me know how I can help. Um, you know, keep it real simple, keep it short. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the reason that they're asking you for stuff. Diana nailed exactly my thinking on it. Um, that, uh, the reason that they want it is so that they will have vetted talent on their roster that they know they can reach out to. Um, they know what you do. Um, they have learned a little bit more about you, um, and they can place you properly. Um, which to swing it around is hopefully what a good agent will do. As I said a few minutes ago, um, that, um, uh, yes, frantic. I'm, I'm replying to frantic's, uh, message up here. Okay. I'll hit them up and send them my info for down the road, future events. Exactly. DJ frantic. You are on it. You are on it. Mm -hmm. Um, being a professional DJ is a very challenging thing, especially when you're having a go at it independently. Um, it's all coming together now, isn't it, Diana? So, um, as we said last week, we were talking about um, different places that you see DJs and Diana's follow-up question. Would you would you hit us with it again, Diana, so that everybody knows where we're at? Well, well what are the things, uh, different things that you've done through your talent agency um, that have been at different places that you've seen DJing? So, okay. So, uh, basically like different types of events and stuff that I've booked, uh, um, through, through my career, that kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So yeah, there's, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of places that we see DJs, you know, last week we were talking about, uh, how I had worked for an agency because they were doing the fashion and retail gigs 
and how I specifically mm-hmm. thought that that was pretty cool and had seen it. And as soon as I saw somebody doing it, I was like, wow, I had never seen anybody doing that before. So of course, what did I want to do? I wanted to do it. <laughs> Which, you know, that's, that's how we keep things interesting for ourselves is by trying different kinds of gigs. Um, that's how we build diversity into our repertoire is doing different types of gigs. So working for an agency, uh, well, you know, working for an agency is going to have its pluses and minuses, uh, no matter what the plus is, is that they do a lot of the dirty work, right? They do the contracts, they negotiate with the clients, they fit the talent to the gig, you know, they, uh, you know, they, manage the logistics, all of that kind of stuff so that you basically don't have to do too much more than consult with your client once or twice, maybe, and, uh, and kind of show up and rock the gig. Of course, when you're doing it independently, you have to do all of your own advertising and, um, um, cold calling, so to speak yourself. So, in the uh, in the beginnings of my professional DJ career, I know I've mentioned it a few times before. I worked for a big agency here in New England, and um, <clears throat> we had fifty DJs on the roster. Um, some of whom would do a handful of gigs in a year, maybe. Some of them who would do eh, one a month, two a month. Some of them who would kind of do every weekend or whatever. Um, I was the crazy one who was like, this is all I really want to do. Um, I want to do all of the weird little midweek gigs that come up that nobody's ever available for, you know what I mean? Like, just give me everything. I like throw everything at me. So like, um, you know, I think this is a good point to sort of uh, throw attack into uh, references and building your value. Because like, I did a lot of gigs for this agency that it was like, wasn't much better than gas money. (laughs) Um, But what I was doing was building my repertoire, um, uh, building my references, especially because like, man, Let me tell you, when you're willing to do things for people, you know, for like small organizations or whatever, which I'm going to get to and that sort of thing where it's like, you know, pretty much charity work, you know, and you're willing to do some charity work, you know, you're willing to do some stuff that's like, yeah, you know, I'm not really getting paid much for this or whatever, but you know, it's outreach and that kind of stuff. Like, first of all, like, if you have fun doing it, it's really worth doing. Like, no matter what, if you if you have fun doing it, it's really worth doing. But here's the thing is that all of those really add to your value. Um, because then when you have your higher end clients, your the high risk gigs um, that you do get paid better for, this is all part of your CV. It's all part of your resume um, that these are the things that that you do. And it shows that you have more diversity and repertoire and, um, you know, have built trust with community and that sort of stuff. Um, the agency that I worked for in the 90s was just absolutely excellent at that. And they found a very willing DJ in me um, to do that kind of stuff. So to get more towards Diana's question, uh, he said needing a sip of something liquid. By the way, if anything that I'm talking about pops some questions into your mind, throw them up in the chat and we'll get to them. Um. I'm, I, my head is like absolutely full of some of the strange gigs that I've done, Diana, but I, I, I would like to kind of focus on a couple of them. Like, <clears throat> um, a few of the things, um, I've done a lot of stuff for like, uh, 
you know, like uh, the the town that the agency was in was North Reading, and like I did their Fourth of July fireworks party, every you know, in the gazebo out on the public green kind of thing, and they do the fireworks and all that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> uh, uh, Ed Carey did a lot of these. Like Ed Carey and I did an awful lot of these together because he was another one. Like you know, he runs his own DJ company now independently and sound company and all that as well he's still doing it but we used to do this together so long ago and um dare events <laughs> yeah so um you know some of the dare events that i did you know again it was kind of that out on the commons under the gazebo you know, family friendly kind of stuff. You're just playing fun music while they have a, you know, it's like they got the bouncy house and that kind of stuff going on and, um, and that kind of thing. But because I was doing those, I ended up getting booked to do an actual dare officers convention down on the Cape, <laughs> Uh, which, I mean, you got a picture. I mean, me, mind you. I see my microphone's popping a little. I'm going to turn that down. Sorry. Um, this is me that we're talking about, right? Like, I'm out I'm out in the parking lot, like, in my, in my hiding in the back of my, my vehicle, like. <sighs> right. Because they're all inside having dinner and I'm going on after dinner. They're going to do dinner and an awards presentation and then I'm going to get them dancing. And um, and I've had to be set up for hours. So, you know, I've had the sandwich that, you know, the, the banquet sandwich for vendors thing. And uh, um, and yeah, I'm, I'm smoking a bowl out in my car about as paranoid as somebody can be because every car in the parking lot is a cop. Mm hmm. But that's just me. Like, do as I say, not as I do, kids. Um, and uh, uh, yes, yeah, so some of those are, are pretty interesting things. Um, oh, there was one that I did. It was uh, and I, I always think of it because of the Kid Creole song Endicott Endicott Park. I did a thing in Endicott park i i don't even really remember what it was but it was like one of those local community uh fundraisers for kids things oh you know what i've done too is i've done like some uh some gigs like well i mean i've done marathon gigs like boston marathon doing like uh you know gigs for the um venues around there like i did one for puma once which was kind of cool but i've done marathon gigs where like uh i've i'm uh you know for like the local marathons right uh where i'm like at the end of the marathon you know in the tent you know um playing music so as people come in and you know everybody's celebrating and having a good time at the finish line kind of thing um one of the gigs that I had for a few years when I was working for the agency, there was a group called the community group. <laughs> and, um, uh, they, <clears throat> uh, so oddly enough, this is what my mother did for a living for many, many years was managed care, group home managed care, um, for mentally and physically disabled adults. And community group was essentially a group very, very much like, you know, the thing that my mother worked for. And they would have events uh, for the clients, you know. Um, and, uh, and so uh, uh, they liked me because I was very, very patient uh, with them, you know, I'd like, I said, my mother did this for a living too. So it's not like I didn't have some experience, uh, there, but, um, you know, obviously not in the industry, but, um, you know, having, having done things like go on, uh, uh, go on day trips and stuff with my mother and, you know, the group home, uh, clients from her network. And, um, and so um, I would do the, and they would do karaoke, um, and it was so sweet; it would make your make you cry. 
sometimes and um and you know you get to learn their names and that sort of stuff and they give you the biggest fucking hugs in the world and of course the um uh the people who are like in my mother's position you know uh were very very grateful um and it was one of those things they they didn't have any money in the budget kind of thing it was one of those like you know it was local to the office you know and so um uh, and i did them and i kept doing them and i did them for like i said several years while i was working for that agency um hey scott duran what's up my buddy um yeah so let's see uh so you know talking about uh talking about gigs um that uh uh some some of the odd things that uh that you end up doing with agencies i guess you know um so another thing that i thought of midweek sort of things were, were harbor cruises and um you know, obviously it's not a super unique to Boston kind of thing, but if you don't have a place with boats around, <laughs> um, but yeah, so the Harbor cruises, they tend to be like three hour gigs. Um, you know, they go out, they sort of cruise around the har Harbor islands kind of thing. And, you know, uh, you know, they like pass the constitution, the USS constitution, and, you know, you get the skyline, you know, and Rose Wharf and all that. Rose Wharf is where a lot of them go out from. There's several wharves along there. Museum Wharf, the museums there, the aquarium. Um, and, uh, oh, that's another gig I've done. I've done gig, I used to do gigs for the aquarium, the Boston Aquarium. Um, I would do events. They had an event tent out back. So I've done weddings there and stuff too, but I've done events for the employees of the aquarium, like they're, um, their own events. Uh, I've done indoor and outdoor events there. I used to joke that I taught, I ta I'm the one who taught the penguins how to mock arena because it was that long ago. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, you, I, I, I have ended up with some interesting gigs. I did a wedding at the Harvard, uh, museum of natural history. So I'm kind of like next to the dodo, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, and I got to see the specimen rooms too, because the, uh, the groom was a herpetologist there. So I got to see like the two Atara specimens and that kind of stuff that they had there. And it's like really into that shit. You know what I mean? Like 12 year old me was just like coolest thing ever. Anyway, um, neat stuff. So yes, uh, you know, that, you know, these are, these are gigs that, um, uh, you know, the, you know, the diversity of gigs, right. Um, and I, I used to do a bunch of stuff for the schools, like, um, boy, I really drifted off from the Harbor cruises, didn't I? But let me get back to those because it's actually related to some of the school stuff too. Um, like I used to do Harbor cruises for Harvard or Harbor cruises for Harvard law. That's not that easy to say. Didn't expect that to be that hard to say. Labyrinth. Good to see you. Um, and, uh, I, I joke sometimes I say, I just missed Obama being at Harvard law. I started DJing those gigs a little bit after he was there, but I'm sure some of the kids who, you know, that I saw, you know, dancing drunk with their shoes off at Harvard law events are like, you know, sitting judges and shit now, you know what I mean? It is after mm -hmm. all Harvard. Um, so uh, the three-hour cruises, right? You know, just sit right back and uh, uh, and hear this tale. Um, the tale of a DJ on a harbor cruise ship. Um, so I used to do a lot of daytime events because um, uh, 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 they would do they would do daytime they would do a daytime cruise and then they would do like an an evening cruise kind of things and you know. The tides would be crazy. Okay, so loading onto these boats, sometimes the ramps are just like amazingly steep because you're loading in at high tide. Um, loading in at low tide was not so bad. It was pretty flat, but you're on these like skinny ramps and you're hoping your shit's not going to fall off into the water, which did happen to a DJ that I know. Dropped an amp. Um, and... Uh, I'm sure there's a few pieces of DJ gear at the bottom of the harbor there around Rose Wharf, but, um, some really nice fucking boats too. But, um, so, 
Uh, yeah, you'd have like, you know, these sort of like afternoon corporate crews kind of things and, you know, um, I don't know, various organizations, groups, that kind of stuff. So, you know, we call them corporate gigs kind of as a lump. Um, and then in the evenings, you know, you might have the weddings and that kind of stuff. Definitely the more formal events. Um, and yeah, so uh, I used to do a lot of those through the agency, um, which is very different, by the way, um, frantic from getting out and going out on the boat for like weeks or months at a time when you're doing the uh, the ocean cruises, the destination cruises, that kind of stuff is you you then you're living on the boat. This is getting on and off the boat, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Harbor cruises. Um, talking about the schools like Harvard, man, like, you know, I feel like I've seen so much inside Harvard. Like I, I barely have an education, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, and, and like, I have seen like the inner halls of Harvard because I'm the DJ. You know what I mean? I've, I've been to the most magnificent venues in New England uh, because I'm the DJ. I've also been in the dingiest, sweatiest, dustiest, grungiest, crappiest places too. It's all of a piece. And, you know, sometimes, sometimes, you know, a lot of times, pardon me, a lot of times when you're doing mobile DJ work, I mean how do I say this? There's no fucking glory in it at all. I mean, like, you know, nightclub DJing, you, you know, is one thing and festival DJing and that kind of stuff. And, you know, like everybody loves to have a big audience, you know, like a lot of times when you're mobile DJing, I mean, <laughs> I have literally done DJ, DJ gigs, you know, through the agency where it's like you show up and like nobody's there and you're literally just like, playing for a few hours to fulfill a contract and it can be difficult. <laughs> well, I have, well, I have a question that speaks to oh, that. Hit, hit me with it. How do, you keep, How do you keep things interesting when you have those types of gigs? <laughs> yeah. How do you keep things interesting when you have those types of gigs? Well, for one thing, you play the gig the same way if there are two people in the room as if there are 200 or 2,000. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the way I always looked at it was, well, if there's nobody here to dance, I can't really blow a dance floor. Mm -hmm. You know, so what do you do? You play something with some tone so that hopefully if some people show up at least you're playing something cool so if they pop in even though you know it's a lame party or whatever if they're popping in and they're like oh this is good music i'll stick around for one more song one more song one more song um how do you keep it interesting i mean if nothing else you, you can you can do a little bit of mental math and say, okay, well, I'm here for five hours and it pays me X. Um, so divided by 60 minutes, <laughs> um, divided by 60 seconds, and you can figure out how many pennies you're making per second to sit here and endure this. <laughs> like, how do you keep it interesting? Hopefully you can entertain yourself. Okay. Um, I, I honestly do believe that a DJ that is able to entertain themselves is themselves an entertainer, you know, mm -hmm. makes them a better entertainer. I guess it's like, um, you know, if, if you can go out and, and, um, like I said, if you can go out and play gigs that, I mean, it's like not your thing. Like, you know, not, not really my thing. 
Um, but I'm going to enjoy it for what it is. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it doesn't matter if I'm playing music that I don't really connect to or whatever. What matters is like, can I have fun with it and hopefully connect to an audience with it? You know, like not, not Mm -hmm. all, you know, here, here's the thing too, is like sometimes you'll come away from a gig where it was like everybody was screaming all night and and throwing their hands in the air and it was a good dance floor and everything but you'll still come away from the night feeling like it just wasn't that great of a night for you you know what i mean it's just like you're just like holy shit that was stressful they drove me fucking crazy I could barely fucking do my job for people trying to get on the stage and dance in my face or, you know, whatever it is like, you know, and you come away and you're just like, Oh, I'm so glad that's over. And you turn on talk radio for your drive home. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, like I said, not all gigs are awesome. You know, like, in fact, I mean, it kind of goes back to what I was saying before about building your references and building your value. Sometimes, sometimes you do those gigs because it's like, it does increase, you know, your visible references, you know what I mean? Or whatever it is. And, and, you know, you do want the referrals and the references. So it's like, yeah, you just kind of grin and bear it, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But as I say, if you can entertain yourself and just kind of enjoy it for what it is, call it practice, whatever. Like I've had gigs, man, Okay, here here's a couple of weird ones for you. Um, you know, we we've talked about places where that you see and hear DJs, but there are definitely some times where you have I've had gigs where like you are expected to be heard, but not seen. Um, okay. Like uh, I have a couple of things uh, in mind, and Diana's heard a bunch of my stories so she'll recognize some of the this is the thing too is not all not all gigs are great some of them are fucking disasters um <coughs> um sometimes you can turn a disastrous gig into a, a great gig i don't know if loki is lurking out there but we have one of his gigs that he had uh we call the mud wedding um where um you know, the weather just was, went fucking haywire. The, uh, the, the site was flooded and just turned to a bunch of mud. So people just, I mean, there, you know, you just couldn't get any more fucked. And so they just accepted it and dove into it with pleasure. And, uh, as Joe said, uh, they wanted the dirty shit (laughs) and they fucking, bumped and grind bump and ground is that the right I don't, they they danced in the mud <laughs> um so you can sometimes turn a shit situation into a uh into a good gig but sometimes you run into actual shit situations i think diana knows what story i'm gonna tell now <laughs> yeah. um so uh, one of my, one of my buddies that I, this is after I had worked for that particular agency, but one of my buddies that I had worked at that agency with, um, had a regular gig over on Boylston street at a bar called the poor house. And they have like, it's like a bar restaurant and they have the upstairs and then they have the downstairs, the basement. And they had like a small, you know, maybe like 15 square, 15 foot square dance floor uh with a couple of cheap spinny lights kind of thing and it was just kind of a big open room with tables kind of around the edges and uh um and on friday and saturday nights it was always pretty busy down there with like the you know the college crowd there's a lot of local colleges there berkeley is right there too um the architectural college is right there and it's, you know, it's one of those places, it's like Boston pub, you know what I mean? It's a Boston pub. And um, it's the poor house, P-O-U-R. Clever. Anyway, um, so they didn't have the entertainment license to have a DJ. Um, and so, this, like I said, this is my friend's gig. 
and um and uh they didn't have the license for the uh for the for the dj so uh the dj had to be in the kitchen the kitchen at that time of night was closed you know they had cleaned it up and it was closed and the dj would set up in the kitchen and cables out to the uh to the speakers uh in the other room and uh you know, so it's like the hallway with the bathrooms on one side and the kitchen doors on the other uh, in the basement, mind you, which is relevant mm -hmm. to the story in a few minutes because stormy nights. And um, uh, and yeah, so if he needed a night off, uh, he would call me or there was one other guy um, that uh, that he would call, you know, to see if we were available to fill in for him. And, you know. It was a pretty easy gig. It was basically you just play whatever popular hip hop was going and throw in some of the classics, you know, college party music. And, you know, again, this is, you know, in the sort of end of the 90s, early 2000s. So it was kind of like, you know, uh, you know, Biggie and that sort of thing were very popular, you know, Big Pun, that kind of stuff. Uh, MC Light, you know, Cold Rock a Party. There you go. That was some times. And, um, uh, but yeah, so the DJ would be in the kitchen playing the music that was then, uh, piped out to the, uh, to the, uh, other room. We'd fill in for him sometimes. So yeah, you're just like in the kitchen there. You can't see anybody, you know, you're just in the kitchen. Um, and, and so like every once in a while, it's like, you kind of peek out the doors like to see, you know what the room looks like is like, you just kind of like, okay, yeah, there's people there. Yeah. Okay. Everything's all right. Going back in. And, uh, um, <clears throat> and other than that, it's like, you're just like looking at all the spices that are on the rack above you. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, you know, there's no fucking human interaction at all. Um, but yeah, so I would fill in on these gigs one night. This is where this is where things go awry. Um, one night I'm in there, and it is you know one of those dreaded fucking nor'easters, and you know uh, storms fucking raging for days, and and drenching and drenching and drenching, and and I'm down there uh, in the basement, in the kitchen, across from the bathrooms. Um, playing you know inv invisible to my audience right and uh and the shit start literally the shit starts bubbling up out the drain um uh the drain holes in the in the floor and so uh as as this is happening now mind you i it's not like i had a microphone i didn't have any way to tell anybody that fucking worked there <laughs> Right. So it's kind of like put something long on, go out the door, up the stairs, find somebody up there, come back down. You know, and um, and yeah. And so the shit's bubbling up. So I'm like moving my equipment over, moving my equipment over, moving my equipment over. Then it starts coming out the fucking bathroom. So it's coming in both fucking directions. And I was like, are we done here? Are we done here? And they were like, yeah, we're done here. I was like, thank you. <laughs> get the shit out of here get this out of here before yeah. oh boy the smell i was kind of like one of those things i was like it's now a health hazard uh but yeah it's you know that's the back bay the back bay was built on a swamp you see like it was landfill built on a swamp there so the basements in the back bay when it when it pours, it pours, my friends. Um, but yeah, talk about a shitty gig, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I've had other gigs where, like, there was there was one where uh, a judge was sworn in, and this was actually this was a gig. This was an, one of those agency gigs, and uh, I was assisting another DJ. Um, it was their gig, um, but you know, with the gear and stuff. Um, and, uh, I think he had, he had a broken something at the time. So I was helping the gear and, uh, um, 
so this judge had gotten sworn in. So we were required to wear tuxedos, um, but they had us set up in a coat room. We were not to be seen. Like there were like once the once the event started, we were not to go through these doors. So it was like cabled the speakers into the other room and all that kind of thing. Set them up as you know, it's like you know you're trying to hide them. You know what I mean? So like you know. Um, but that was before the days of like, you know, iPad playlists and that kind of thing. Now, now that would be an iPod playlist. That's probably what they do at the poor house nowadays. I don't know. Like, you know, my friend, my friend continued to do that gig for many years. I, um, I, I is, that, that might've been the last time I did that gig. I think <laughs> it, Yes, Ekim, a literal shitstorm. Um, yeah, storms in storms in New England are nothing to fuck with. Um, but yeah, the uh, the every uh, you know the it it wasn't just the poorhouse. I need to emphasize this. It wasn't just the poorhouse. It, it was you know there the whole block is restaurants and um, shops and stuff. There's a lot of, there's not a lot of nice places down there. I used to, I used to have a residency, uh, uh, it, it was JP Hillary's at the time. And, uh, it's like right there across from the Peru and they had this nice, um, disco upstairs there. And like, that was a fun one because it was a place where I could like really go shake out the, uh, the remixes of the, uh kind of more popular tunes that was before i uh, was at the polo club so it, it was kind of you know the you know that that's one of those things like building your value it's like you know i um that was when i was kind of like you know learning to be a club dj if that makes sense and of course newberry street being right there uh at the time there was just so many record shops do, 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 and they all had kind of different stuff so you could go get the imports and all that and go oh. <laughs> and like dj bruno sitting up at satellite just fucking you know so th this is a quick story about uh record shopping on newberry street because this was something that we'd kind of do like every week or every other week or whatever because there were so many as like tower and newberry comics and satellite and i just you know there were several used places too but there were several that were like just djs like no normal people when no no civilians went in there just djs you know to get the latest fucking imports um with the juiciest freshest stuff and so you'd go in and you'd drop needles with the headphones and you'd drop needles on something and listen to it before you buy it um it's pretty cool um, but, uh, uh, um, there was, uh, one particular shop. Why is it? Was it Boston beat? No, was it Boston beat? Yeah, it was Boston beat. Um, and DJ Bruno was a proprietor there. He's a very popular club DJ in Boston and well-known. And, uh, um, he's the one that he's the first person. DJ that I ever saw uh, beat matching just open fader on both turntables because he would just sit there at the counter like the count it was like the cash register the DJ booth right <laughs> and he would just have a stack of new records and he would be popping them on he had never heard them before and he'd be popping them on to the turntables there and throw the needle down and just kind of zoop, 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 and just uh, bang, 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 beat match. You know, just open faders on the thing. Like, you know, he's not, he's not, you know, a, you know, just open fader mixing and, and, you know, kind of practicing, you know, while he's, just all day long, you know. And, uh, and when I saw that, I was like, I got to up my game. Like, I want to be able to mix that fast. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You know, with no fear, just no fear. Um, but it never goes away, my friends. You know, you've always got that 
you know, uh, one of the things that does keep it interesting, and I, I've said this before to continue down this rabbit hole, Diana, one of the things that has kept it interesting okay. for me over the course of my career is that that has never gone away. Um, I always have that element of stage fright. I'm always anxious before my gigs. I have a hard time eating, you know, before my gigs, that kind of thing. Even the things we do on Saturday nights, I'm anxious about it. Like I'm thinking about it for a couple of days ahead. And uh, actually, I'm really thinking about it long before that because I'll get ideas and I'll put them in a uh, in an idea folder. <laughs> but like... Um, you know, that it never goes away. Other ways that you keep it interesting, like I said, is you do a diversity of stuff that is like, you know, like I said, I've done so many gigs where it's just like, it's not really my thing. But I'm going to make it my thing. You know, it's like being a good actor, right? Method actor, right? I'm going to, I am going to, I'm going to dip into this musical history that I don't really have any connection to, um, and I'm going to connect to it, you know? Um, yeah. I'm going to do the research to understand, you know, like they have given me hopefully a bit of something to work with, some requests that they, you know, stuff that they're going to want to hear, and then I'm going to dive from there. How do you keep it interesting? Because, okay, Diana, we have both complained about that. There is more music being released today than we could listen to in a lifetime. So don't feel guilty about mm -hmm. not knowing something. Just keep learning more. Like sometimes sometimes you will not hear something for so long and then you will hear it again and you're like, that's what that is. It happens to me all the time. I love it. You know, you can't, you can't, you know, uh, uh, Ed that I mentioned before that I used to work with at the agency, we used to joke, um, by the time we had both been there for a while, we used to joke, uh, um, uh, about how much music we had forgotten. It's like, it is, it is kind of one of those jokes. It goes, it goes around, uh, anyway, but it's like, you know, there gets to be a point as a DJ where like you've forgotten more music than most people have ever known. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, we, you know, as DJs, we definitely hold these giant musical worlds in our heads. And the more that we can add to it, the more we contribute to our knowledge, the, the better we become at connecting to a variety of audiences. Like I said before, having a diversity of, of gigs, you know, there are so many, you know, so what you had said, Diana, last week was that there are, you know, you see, you see DJs at pretty much any social function. Mm -hmm. It's pretty much any social function. I mean, you know, needless to say, I've done a hell of a lot more weddings than I have funerals, but I've done a couple of those too for friends, you know, for past friends. Um... And, uh, yeah, I've done things like, you know, I've done birthday parties for like three-year-olds or like christening parties and that kind of stuff. Right. And like, you know, literally playing like, you know, the hokey pokey for kids, you know what I mean? You know, cause you're not playing for the adults, you know, <laughs> Um, now, needless to say, you know, that's agency gigs and those are the kind of gigs it's like, you know, I took those gigs because I wanted to learn those gigs. Actually, you know, you know, it was an interesting one. I was thinking about this recently, like um, we used to do these gigs for uh, this was another one of those. Um, uh, it was like an after school group. Um, it was up in Lawrence, um, and, um, and they had this after school group for the kids and a lot of the kids were Latino. And this was like before reggaeton had really been like stamped with a name, but they, they always wanted the 
the Puerto Rican hip hop, the Puerto Rican hip hop, the Puerto Rican hip hop. And like, I took those gigs because like, then I learned a lot more Latin music, you know, and I discovered more stuff. And, um, you know, I've done event, you know, there, there have been things where I've done like so many events in a particular venue that I end up doing the employee parties for that venue. Um, man, some of the places are crazy. Like, um, yeah, we're talking, talking about like weird little setups and stuff there. Oh shit. We were like running up on three o'clock pretty fast. Yes. Um, should I interrupt myself? Yes. I, I, I do see something else come up there from, uh, frantic before we get going. Yeah, maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe yeah, interrupt yeah. you for a minute. Uh, Frantic says, speaking of, uh, Frantic says, speaking of agencies, do you know anybody I could check into it to look for it online? That is, or is there a website hmm. I need to go to? Like how how to find an agency? You mean? Yeah. Um. Yeah. Well, so so to be perfectly honest with you, the way that I found. The first agency that I worked for was they had an, an ad in the paper and uh, my future ex-wife at the time was like, you could do that. And I was like, yes, I could. And so uh, I called. Now, this is a funny thing, man. When I showed up for that interview, you know, I, I, I was a rock and roll drummer, you know, and goth as fuck. And so, you know, I showed up to my interview for this talent agency with you know long black hair down to my nipples and a fucking blonde streak and 20 whole docks and an island electric you know funky ass shirt you know and uh uh <clears throat> um so um they they ended up calling me back for a second interview and i found out later after i had been hired that um the operations manager wanted to hire me like right after the first interview on the spot. He was like, he was like, I don't know what it is about this dude, but I love his energy. And I feel like he's just going to be really passionate about this. And, uh, the sales manager was like, how the fuck am I going to sell that on a wedding? Right. And the, op the operations manager was like all kinds of people get married. You know what I mean? Um, funny enough, it, and that's kind of what ended up, I mean, now mind you, you know, like I, I have shifted my style a bit here and there over the years and, you know, um, you know, I, I had cut my hair shorter and, uh, and that kind of stuff, uh, after doing the mobile thing for a while, you know, so that I could get the better gigs. I didn't really cut it to get the better gigs, but you know, it was, I was not playing in rock bands anymore. I was being a professional DJ. So, um, um, but that did kind of lead to, you know, my independent career of being the DJ who does weddings for the kind of people who aren't looking for the typical agency wedding DJ. Um, so it, it is okay to specialize, but that's another way that I keep it interesting is by, you know, it's like, you know, I took all that experience and I started doing my own thing and, you know, uh, and I got to be more particular about the clients that I was choosing. And since I wasn't being, you know, paid a percentage by the agency, you know, the lion's share was going to me. I could take less gigs and focus more on those individuals, you know, not doing the, the kind of weird you know, town stuff, the dare stuff, the, you know, all that stuff that I did when I was building my value and building my references, you know, now at that point, you know, I had a long list of references and, you know, could present those to my independent clients and that sort of thing. And, um, but I feel like I've run off the question entirely, which was how do you find an agency? When I found Scratch, it was because I was searching, uh, I was searching for agencies. And I, at that point, like I, I had mentioned last week, I was really looking specifically for the type of age. Like I was looking for agencies that were doing these branded gigs. 
right? You know, that, that yeah. we're doing these, um, you know, in-store retail events and doing the fashion events and that sort of stuff. So Scratch was doing that at the time. I don't know. I don't think they're doing it now. You know, the, like I had said at one point, the, um, the person whose brainchild that was moved on to work for like Google or something. So, um, we have run up on. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, seen. there is no space couch today. Um, but yeah, I, we, we ought to, um, stick to our usual format here and get going. So I am just going to answer frantic and say the way that you look for a DJ agency, um, is you start Googling, <laughs> Um, for DJ agencies in your area. And then you go and you look at their websites. And hopefully they'll have profiles on their DJs and you'll get to take a look at their, you know, blurbs, their bios. And see the kind of gigs that those agencies are doing and the kind of feedback that they're getting. You know, you will always get an impression to some degree by the website itself like it doesn't have to be fancy is it professional you know is it <clears throat> you know is it speaking your language um mm -hmm. and um and you know and that is how you find an agency these days is because that's how your clients are going to find them too it's like they're not looking in the yellow pages anymore you know um and <laughs> So if you find if you find agents, you know, that are within your re reasonably local driving distance, I mean, you know, if you're doing mobile work, there are a few things, you you know, it's like you got to have wheels, you got to have a sound system or, you know, if they have the availability to rent them, you know, that kind of thing. It's like, you know, it, it depends a bit on your area, actually, a lot of the DJs in New York City. Um, what they do, the agencies even, they, they hire a sound company to go in and set up the sound and then the DJ can take a train because you're bringing your laptop and your headphones basically. Um, but in most places, you're on your own. <laughs> you got to be responsible for all the transportation, the management and, and upkeep of your gear and all that kind of stuff. How do you find an agent? You look for an agent in your local area the same way the clients will you search and see who's out there and um and yeah and then you know it is it is a little bit of cold calling or you know perhaps there will be a you know uh, a link you know some sometimes on the website it'll have like a you know if you're interested in working with us email here um, but generally there is some sort of contact link because how, how would uh, any of the other customers <laughs> get to find them and, um, and probably a phone number. And, um, and this is one of those things where, I mean, if you're contacting an agency, I would say it's, it's very worth giving them a call rather than sending an email like give them a call, let them hear your voice and say, Hey, you know, um, I'm a DJ. I've been doing this for this long and I'm wondering if you're looking to take on any additional talent, you know, like I've been looking at your website and I think we'd click. Well, is it possible to set up an interview or an audition? That's another thing too, is depending on the agency, like scratch you had to audition for, you know, uh, one, uh, one of the employees there once said to me that it's, uh, harder to get into scratch than it is to get into Harvard at the time anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I went through, I went through a very long process to get into scratch. Um, it, it really was, it, it took me like a year, um, because, you know, I reached out to mm -hmm. them, um, uh, a couple of times to spark their interest and then it was kind of like okay well like and this is of course you know like mixed cloud wasn't a thing back then you know so it was kind of like you know send us a mix kind of thing and then uh and then so send us a mix and then it was okay make us a mix right like with a theme and then 
it was audition in person um in new york they were in the uh 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 which building was it it was one of the old press buildings oh it was the village voice building that's what it was um so that was kind of cool i auditioned for scratch in the village voice building um, but yeah, had to do a live audition. Um, and you know, then you have to do all the stuff to fulfill their branding stuff too. So it was like, you know, um, photographs, video shoot to do a, a, a short video mix where, you know, essentially you're quick mixing everything, edited versions. Um, you know, it was a, a, a lot of hoops to jump through, but, um, you know, they're a very <clears throat> exclusive agency and like, they strongly brand themselves on the talent being um, world-class. Um, and so, um, you know, if you're, if you're looking for, um, if you're looking for good agencies, look for good branding. Um, and like I said, you know, be prepared to audition. Um, uh, and, uh, yeah, knock them dead. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I do see that we are, uh, a fair bit past three o'clock now. Cause I, you know, I can talk about this stuff all day and often do, and we'll do it again next Sunday. Mm -hmm. Um, so mm -hmm. think about what you'd like to talk about. Of course, you can send us questions over on the, you want to say it, Diana? Over on you the Patreon, she reminds me I need to say the Patreon, A-D-D-A-M-B-O-M-B-B, -B -B, which of course is how you'll find me anywhere on the internet. Um, and uh, yeah, um, so Wednesday we've got Tender Lash uh, on uh, New Music O'Clock, hosting New Music O'Clock. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, Saturday night it's going to be the Wicked Party and we'll be back here next Sunday for more of this. And uh, thank you, Dusty Chin. Thank you, Frantic. Thank you, Ekim. Thank you, all of you who are out there watching that I can't see because the chat's been going by pretty quickly. But uh, yeah, do do send us the questions. Um, think about the questions you'd like to talk about for next week and send them to us in the chat over here as well. And um, shit, am I missing anything, Diana? Uh, I think uh, I Okay, I well, then we'll it. pick up the conversation again next week on Musically Minded, same bat time, same bat channel. Thank you, Diana, DJD42, for kicking off the conversation, keeping us going, and letting you know all the good things that are going on in the chat room. Uh, thank you again for your support. Thank you so much for joining us. Let's hit the theme song. <laughs>